Hello and welcome to the Nish Guarda Cities ABC Open Business Council YouTube podcast series. Um, I'm actually excited to be here again to discuss the challenges and profiles of some of the people that are changing the world and creating better narratives and actually solutions for both our society, our businesses, our industries, and as well our academic and research. During our hours, over 150 50 interviews that we've been doing, we've been profiling leaders of the world, leaders of the academy, leaders of political ecosystem like ministers and different personalities. But all these people share the same common interest to make the world a better place and as well to look at ways we can use tech for good, that you can accelerate business innovation and the ways of looking in a better constructive narrative that actually can create more value for everyone involved in our society and empower our different areas of society. Today, I welcome to our series uh, someone that actually I've been working recently and very excited to coordinate and build more um, footprint and ideas, but as well changing the world with business and, and, and as well taking it in practice. Uh, so I welcome to our series, Jonathan Sim. So Jonathan Sim is the Chief Procurement Officer for the French company and the global conglomerate NG. And as well, uh, that is right now a spin-off company, uh, quite new Equins, and an experienced senior executive manager. Jonathan Sim has over 25 years of experience in different industries, including engineering, energy, and construction. Uh, he has both an academic and business acumen and a strong connection with the academy where he holds four university degrees, including an MBA, a doctorate in business administration, and as well has been working in research in terms of um, uh, multiple universities and as well in guest lecturing. Through his work, uh, both in construction, engineering, and the energy sector, Jonathan has been uh, leading multi-billion dollar projects and as well uh, original qualified that is developing surveyor it brings significant knowledge of asset management, land acquisition, commercial property developing to the projects he's been involved. Jonathan Sim has worked for, the, for two of the largest privately owned construction engineering groups in Europe and various roles from strategic business projects, human resources, procurement and business transformation. Currently, Jonathan Sim uh, works for the French uh, global uh, multinational NG. Uh, Equins, that right now is a subset of the company, where he manages an annual spend of 1.2 billion pounds on goods and services with a team of uh, 65 plus people. In this capacity, Jonathan holds expert knowledge in risk management, people development, zero carbon solutions, which is something that you're going to be talking in this interview, but as well due diligence and responsible business practices. So from the strong connection and as well experience that Jonathan Sim has in the academia, besides the four university degrees that includes an MBA and doctorate in business administration, Jonathan as well is versed in delivering cultural change programs and managing transformation within organization, which is one of the key things for our time. And as well, uh, Jonathan has been an external advising practitioner to the Nothing, Nothing and Business School for the last nine years. And he's a guest lecturer at Durham Business School on the executive MBA and DBA programs. So quite an impressive profile. Welcome to our series, Jonathan. Thank you, Dinesh. Delighted to uh, be with you here today. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, and I'm quite excited to see how you manage all these different parts of your CV. Uh, we've been interviewing a lot of academics and business people, but someone that touch high profile business and high profile academics, not a lot of people can do this, especially for uh, roles or for um, uh, achievements on this area, especially the academia, which is big thing in itself, but you are as well doing big thing in business. So I would like to start with a bit of an introduction from you, a bit of background overview and about all this education that you leverage in parallel with building your uh, business career. Of course. And I think, firstly, I think the, that, that commitment to being a lifelong learner is something that I think is, is hugely important in, in business and, and, and does keep you um, incredibly relevant uh, w w within the organisation. And I think bringing academia and, and, and business together is, is really powerful. Um, but perhaps if I give you an overview of my, of my career uh, to date, um, 
fr from school, uh, the, I, I joined the family business straight from leaving school, which was a, a, a development uh, and maintenance business. And uh, the sort of the logical step at that point was for me to pursue a, a career in surveying and become a chartered surveyor, which, which I did. Um, and experienced good growth within the family business for a 10 year period before moving over into um, uh, Shepherd and Shepherd Group, which I, which I mentioned, which was a, which was a big move. And Shepherd Group at the time were the largest privately owned engineering and construction organization in Europe. Um, very entrepreneurial organization, third generation family business uh, and invested in me significantly in terms of academic development. So I did a master's degree and an MBA. Um, during, that biz during that time, my master's degree was in human resources and I got involved in a number of uh, projects in that space, looking at people development, talent, talent mapping, succession planning, um, before taking on a strategic business projects role, which if, if I'm going to be honest, was probably the best role I ever had because it was uh, no, no one day was the same. Um, my remit was whatever was important to the CEO on a particular day and I got to have a really good breadth of experience, which um, led on to a deep look into organisational culture within Shepherds as part of the MBA thesis. And that's something that's probably been a 10 year passion from that point on. And then um, prior to joining, um, I moved through another a, a number of PLCs in, in different procurement roles in that space as well, um, building quite a specialism around mechanical, electrical contracting and supply chain transformations. Again, two major PLCs in the UK, Morgan Sindel and Kia. Um, before taking on a, a supply chain transformation role at NG Bailey, which uh, is the largest privately owned uh, engineering company in Europe. So I've worked for both of those organizations now. Um, and, and, and more recently, I decided to pursue the doctorate just, just at the point of uh, prior to joining NG. Um, and I think that's, that's been phenomenal, really, in, in combining um, business with, with theory. Um, to, to actually drive some meaningful change within organizations. So I want to touch, uh, um, how did you cope between the, the business, uh, all the business profile, which is quite significant and big, big uh, organizations, and as well, very normally conservative organizations. I think if you are in technology, normally there's a bit more of flexibility, but on these organizations, normally there's much more sense of, uh, I would say, um, the time and the, and I think the the legacy is very very heavy, um, but as well building your academic career. So I would like to touch that. How did you cope with the two things? It's very 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 good question and very pertinent and particularly to the sector of of, of construction and engineering. I mean, if I if I go back to um, Shepherd Group at the time when I worked for that organisation, there was one individual that sat on the executive team that held an undergraduate degree. So I think that probably puts the context of academia is not at the forefront necessarily of, 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 of that particular sector. But I was very fortunate that I had um, some very, very strong mentors. And I think I've, I've benefited from that. And individuals that saw the, uh, the, the, the opportunity to move into a space and, 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 and thinking that, that, that the organization hadn't, hadn't been in that space before. So, um, there was definitely a sales aspect to it and aligning my MBA very closely with um, the wants and needs of the CEO was, was very important and um, continual reporting. So I was sitting in on the exec meetings on a, almost a monthly basis, giving them feedback on what I was finding and, and experiencing within the MBA that was very relevant to the business. And that helped manage the tensions that do exist where sometimes people can think you're drifting off and doing something that's a little bit too theoretical. Um, I encountered, you know, um, quite a bit of resistance initially, uh, not within NG, but in, 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 a, in a previous business when I first started to socialize the idea of doing a PhD or a DBA, um, because the perceptions were it was going to be very, very um, theoretical. There'd be difficulties in, in bringing that into practice. And again, you have to find those enlightened people within an organization that are prepared to invest in that, which uh, I was fortunate again to find that within NG. Um, at a group level, um, completely different landscape to previous businesses. There are a, a number of people, VP level, exec board that hold PhDs, MBAs, master's degrees. So it was more nurtured within that environment. And, um, but again, there, there is a, there is a, 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 a pressure 
for me, uh, I, even though I was part time on the, the DBA, I, I concluded that in three years because I felt I had to have quite some intensity around getting that completed quickly to enable you know me to focus on the on the on the business drivers as well. Really impressive. Um, in terms of a DBA, so can you tell us about? I know that you 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 did, and of course the MBA, but I think you can touch a bit to what you what were your focus of your studies? Because I know that some of these studies are very relevant for what is happening in the world today of business, both from carbon neutrality to a lot of things in terms of supply chain, construction, and even change management, which is one of your areas of expertise as well. So can you tell us a bit about the focus of your both MBA and and DBA and as well how do you cope in terms of this research so you touch a bit that it was related as well with your business at the time but I know that uh, a lot of these things have actually were taken over and became a bit bigger than just uh, uh, present relationships that we had with the industries that were sponsoring or you were managing at the time. Yeah absolutely so if I start with the the MBA as I said this was the, the this was when I was working within um, Shepherd Group which was a, again a, a, a very unique business within the UK, 700 million pound turnover, privately owned organization, third generation family that was competing um, for some very technically complex uh, major infrastructure projects, such as the, the conversion of Drax power station from um, coal fire to biomass, 200 million pound group scheme. Um, for the first time in when I was there within the organization, the, 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 the business had a um, uh, an MD that was a non-family member. So that was a significant shift and the organization was on a journey to professionalize. So my uh, MBA was all about looking at the, the organizational culture and understanding um, what factors were driving certain behaviors, what were gonna be the issues in, 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 in driving cultures forward and how could we create effectively that more bottom up drive of, of, of positive behaviors and, and, and acceptance of, of, of the necessary changes. Um, Moving the clock on, I think probably almost 10 years when I commenced on the, um, the, the, the DBA, that was a, a very deep dive into um, decentralized uh, organizations, ideally you know, global organizations um, that, are un, that are embarking on significant amounts of change. And it was uh, a deep look into the concept of liminality which um, it, 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 I'll try and keep that as succinct as I can, uh, effectively a, a, a period in time where organizational actors are very much in limbo. So they know that there is significant change taking place. It's change that's perhaps affecting their identity with the business, uh, their sense of purpose, their sense of belonging. Uh, it might be challenging status quo. And it's a very interesting time within an organization where people can um, either support the shift or they can start to mobilize significant resistance and, and stifle change. And it also touched on um, the need for strategic clarity in change. There is a concept of uh, non-strategic ambiguity, which is not uncommon in, in, in huge global organizations where people give actors and, and uh, geographical re uh, regions the bones of the change process, but allow them to find their own way with the execution and the delivery. And obviously that can in itself lead to very mixed results. So this was a call for, you know, absolute clarity and strategic shift and, 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 and taking uh, organizational actors along the journey of, of, of significant change. So coming back to that part, so, so from the topics that you study, and I think these industries are normally in this podcast, normally you go much more to technology and the, all the, the kind of more cutting edge, more trendy mm -hmm. elements. But construction is one of the biggest, if not the biggest industry uh, or one of the biggest industries in the world. And of course, you mentioned as well energy, where you are right now with energy. So can you tell us from these industries in particular, how do you see the, the main, from your research and as well from working in high profile jobs, what are the main kind of uh, changes going on there? Because of course, everything is becoming digital, but there's a lot of things that are still paper, that are still legacy systems that are really, okay, houses are houses, construction is construction. But right now we have from construction to digital twins, we have a lot of things that are really bringing the bridge between all these different things in one end from a technology perspective. But then there's the management part, like you mentioned, and I, I as well from part of my family, I have a construction background. And I know that um, the level of education is very low, but it's a bit of a paradox because you have, when you go to construction, you have like the, the builders, but you have the architects, you have all the, the, the regulatory part that you have to do in the cities. 
And then there's the management, because this is big projects that involve politicians, that involve authorizations, involve environmental, um, if you're construction in one location versus another. And then, of course, involves a lot of things in terms of energy and efficiency. So it's quite complex. It's in there like an orchestra with a lot of different areas. So your work has been kind of transversal to all of these different areas, both as a sea level personality and as well looking at from procurement to strategy to management. But I would like to touch how do you see these industries in particular and the change management going through them, both internal and external and in terms of ecosystem? So it's a big question, but I, I think you can answer on that. Yes, and, uh, and, where, and where to start with that. But if I touch on the, 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 the change aspect in the study first, you know, um, phenomenally relevant to the sector and the industry at this moment in time, because there is a huge amount of change that is... Um, Hitting a, hitting a business that is, is, is typically quite, uh, a sector that is typically quite slow to respond to some of those changes. And there is a, a real burning platform around. So the issue probably keeping us awake at night is um, the EDI agenda and our need to be uh, more representative society and inclusive. And there's a, 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 a myriad of academic papers written on just how um, male, pale and stale the construction and engineering sector is and, and, and that starts to impact on our ability to attract the brightest minds into the sector. Um, the, 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 the drive to, to zero carbon by 2050 is, 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 is a huge um, impact on our uh, sector and our organisation. So NG globally as a business contributes about 0.5% of all carbon. So we are a a huge um, carbon heavy organization that's a phenomenal challenge for us we produce more carbon as an organization than Netherlands as a country to put that into context um, digital uh, the shift to digital within uh, not only a procurement space but within a construction space is a huge um, challenge for the industry collaboration in a digital world through BIM with with key trades uh, uh, we, we, traditionally a very a very contractual uh, sector so collaboration between um, supply chains is something that that, that, that is not uh, we're not as advanced as other sectors such as automotive or um, aerospace that isn't something that's in our DNA at this moment in time um, and in and in terms of um, other changes I think the, the supply chain is becoming far more global as we're seeing you know recently with the impact of, of, of supply as, a, as an organization, we're having to have a far more multi-BU global focus to dealing with our major suppliers, which is probably 50 or so organizations. We can't just uh, treat them in a particular way on a contract in, in a particular BU. We have to have a much more wider global appreciation of that relationship and that, that kind of ecosystem. Yeah, it's really an impressive uh, list of things and are, all of them are really like uh, the tip of the iceberg. Let's put it that way, but it's not easy to go from the theory to the practice. So I want to go, you, you touch NG where you're present in a very high profile global uh, role. So I'll just read some numbers about NG and I would like to, to have your overview about the company, about uh, your work there, some of the subsidiaries and as well the ecosystem that you have because it's quite an impressive um, big business but as well uh, it's a company that is so big but not so well known from the public so NGSA for people listening to us is a French multinational electric utility company headquartered in La Defense, um, Courbevoie in, in, in France which operates in the fields of energy transition electricity generation and distribution, natural gas, nuclear, renewable energy, and petroleum. Uh, the stock is value, it's been around 11, almost 12 euros. Um, the, the CEO is Catherine McGregor, and the revenue in 2019 alone was $60 billion uh, plus, 60.1 billion. It has 171 employees, and this is numbers of 2019. And uh, some of the subsidiaries that are including Coffoli, uh, Electrobel, NG Home Services, and of course now uh, is as well creating a new spin-off that is public, but I know that it's quite early days, that is Equins. So can you tell us about the company and as well your work in the company? Yeah, of course. I mean, so you, you, you've summarized some, some, some of the key key threads there, but you know, the, uh, a, a, a global leading organization in its space, predominantly 
uh, if you were to summarize that into primary core, uh, primary two primary areas, energy and services is, 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 is what we're best known for. As you said, uh, circa 60 billion euro turnover uh, in excess of 160,000 staff, an annual spend on goods and services of more than 20 billion euros. We have in excess of 140,000 vendors globally, uh, circa 10,000 of those represent about 80% of our spend. Um, in the UK alone, we're a 3.6 billion sterling uh, turnover organisation. Um, we have three primary areas of, of, of strength, uh, urban regeneration, uh, FM services, and the production and supply of uh, energy. My particular focus within the, with, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a focus both at a UK level and at a group level, because I sit on the European Procurement Committee, which is seven or eight of the, um, uh, the more senior client solutions uh, centric CPOs. So those CPOs that have predominantly service-based activities within their portfolio. Um, but at a UK, on a UK level, I have a team of circa 65 um, procurement staff and we have quite a broad remit. So we deal with not only operational procurement, we look at central category management, which uh, generates COI of around 17 million sterling a year in terms of pro procurement performance. So it's a significantly um, uh, strong uh, ROI as a team. Um, we look after bids and mobilizations, so we get involved in the winning and mobilization of contracts. Uh, and we also have, a, a, and I'm really pleased to have this within my portfolio, which is support and performance uh, team, which is, is many, many things, but gives me a link into responsible business. So we start to get into the, um, the, the, the more um, transformative aspects of, of supply chain change. So these are our relationships with organizations such as Ecovardis, where we're looking at um, the responsible business and, and, and sustainable performance of our supply chain. It starts to lead us into what we're going to do with carbon and the challenges of mapping scope one, two, and three across our entire supply chain. And we look at governance and accreditations and, 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 and all of those things as well. Um, hugely diverse as a business we've, uh, within the UK and globally, but we've got projects uh, where we'll be working in the, um, for, for the cabinet office and government, uh, the, the health service, we can do very, very small glazing contracts through to in Rougely, where we're building a three and a half thousand home um, smart village decentralized energy on a former uh, coal fired power station of Rougely. So really, really broad uh, scope of activities from hard and soft services. It's really impressive. And I think it's this kind of things that, uh, well, is the world economy. And sometimes we only think about the, the likes of the multinationals that are really more public, but this is really serious business and serious as well impact in society. So I want to touch, um, so you mentioned the carbon footprint of NG, and I know that you are an expert in carbon neutral solutions. Uh, this is one of the biggest challenges of society, uh, both on the day-to-day -day that is already kind of both political, but as well actually in day-to-day -day it's, it's affecting all of us because the there's, there's, of course, the deniers, but I don't think anyone can just ignore the impact that is having in our society. Um, and as well, all these changes, climatic changes that are becoming bigger and bigger. So how do you see the carbon neutral kind of solutions for both our society and companies like NG? I mean, it's uh, uh, the, the, the focus on carbon. Um, at so many different levels, whether it's, it's from clients, whether it's from government, whether it's from our own supply chain, um, it, it is huge and, it's, and it's a, it is a phenomenal burning platform for us. And I think for me, where everybody's striving to get to at this moment in time, and we have a team within NG that are our procuring carbon neutral team, is the, 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 the driver for us at the minute is to baseline and have that really robust understanding across as I said, more than 100,000 vendors of heat mapping where our carbon is actually coming from a, a scope three level. So it's, it's about understanding which services and which categories of spend and which subcontractors are the biggest contributors and how we can target um, the reduction of, of, of that uh, embodied carbon. And it is a, a, a myriad of focus areas. It's about looking at alternative methods of delivery be that moving to prefabricated solutions where, where applicable, um, 
reducing um, the, the, the embodied carbon in finished products and looking at the selectivity of products that we bring in and, 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 and the ge geographies within which we procure um, products. It's about the types of organisations we work for, uh, work with, and it's being much more mature in our procurement routes because we need to be, we need to be working uh, far more closely, far more collaboratively and innovatively with, with fewer suppliers um, where we can take all that abortive cost out of the supply chain of bidding work with lots and lots of companies and work with more enlightened organisations on offering um, true, sustainable, uh, car zero carbon solutions for our clients. And then upstream, there's a huge amount of maturity required at a, um, a client level because this transition is not always going to result in the lowest possible prime cost. We've got to be mature in that this transition is an investment for for all parties in some cases, um, but it's but it's a it's a journey. It's it's one that at the minute we're on the uh, you know the first rung of the ladder in, in in moving into this space from a supply chain perspective and 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 really mapping out that impact and and, and producing our roadmap. I'm pleased to say that the UK uh, business within NG is going to be the first organisation to pilot the, uh, the, the the sort of the initial deep dive of looking at scope three. Um, so I think that's really exciting and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of um, getting our head around that impact and, and, and further developing that strategy. Wonderful and, and congratulations first of all on that level. So I, I want to go a bit more deep on this. So, so you've been working with uh, hundreds of thousands of companies uh, as at a procurement, probably actually close to 200,000, which is quite an achievement. So can you tell us, because one of the things I, so there's a lot of theory and there's a lot of discussions around uh, carbon neutral solutions, but how can we make this in a simple way for a business to get this right? Because I think we need to go through the clutter, through all the kind of the prejudice that there is against this topic. And as well, a lot of even lack of knowledge or lack of education. But at the same time, like you said, it, we have to get it done. So how do you, let's say for someone, for a small, medium business or even a medium big business, how can actually they tackle this, especially with your experience, like you mentioned in the UK, where you guys are quite advanced on this? I think the, the, what, what I've seen certainly over the last, I will say 12 to 18 months, is, is, is organisations um, uh, and, and, and even academics str uh, scrambling to, to, to create this um, far too, trying to eat the elephant effectively. Um, and I'll give you an instance of that. Um, our supply chain is, is incredibly varied and we've got organisations that are multi-billion pound turnover distributors and suppliers and we've got um, hundred, you know, tens of thousands of SMEs and, and micro organisations that effectively could be a man in a van uh, driving around servicing an air conditioning unit on one of our sites. So to think that you could um, apply one question set to map uh, scope three carbon across all of that dynamic supply chain and get a, 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 an answer and a baseline is, is, is very unrealistic. And I think people are trying to probably attack it with a, with a, a one size fits all solution. The, the, the primary driver for me is to understand that baseline and that needs to be you know, quite in the first instances a relatively simple assessment of, of, of heat mapping your supply chain and understanding where the, where the focus areas should be and working as, as we are with our, our major organisations first and foremost. So the 10,000 organisations out of that plus 100,000 vendors um, it, where the biggest impact is. And I think it's about demonstrating, um, I don't want to say quick wins, but um, case studies of where we've been able to make meaningful impact um, by doing things differently. Um, and I think it's, 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 it starts with, you know, also being far more mature in how we go about um, our procurement. You know, we have to be working in a far more partnered way with organisations to make a difference because there's got to be that mutual investment in the relationship. And if we're driving as a client, bad procurement practices and, 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 and an abortive cost into the supply chain and organisations are having to bid lots and lots of op, um, opportunities to win work with us. That's all wasted opportunity and, 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 and cost that we could be channeling to driving a better, more sustainable solution. So this concept, um, 
is kind of part of a broader, broader uh, element that we are right now talking that is ESG. So ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Corporate Governance, uh, data that refers to metrics related to intangible assets within the enterprise businesses and the form of corporate social credit score. And research shows that intangible assets compromise an increasing percentage of future enterprise value and, and ultimately it becomes like a, a measure of, of a measure and a metric for any business worldwide. So I know that this is a concept that you have quite a lot of expertise. So first of all, could you highlight how do you see this context with the context, because of course the environmental is the carbon neutral, but there's as well the, the other areas, the other S and G, that is the social and the corporate governance, which are critical. So first of all, how do you see the context, the, the concept, and how you look at this from your experience uh, in both big networks of companies and in companies like ESG, um, oh, sorry, NG? So, I mean, going back to, um, to, to one of the earlier questions in terms of the challenges that, 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 that our sector is facing and, 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 and the, the, the areas, if you like, that are keeping us up at night, they, they are all within this um, ESG space. So we, we, we've talked about carbon, but um, equality, diversity and inclusion is, is, is massively important within our business. And equally, from a governance perspective, we have um, an independent scrutiny board now which, go, which is an independent group of very, very senior uh, leaders and, 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 and government representatives that effectively are now holding our executive team to account on our responsible business uh, commitments and agenda. Um, as a function, I also work hand in hand with our responsible business director, uh, so much so that we've effectively become one team uh, in the space of about, I'd um, say 12 months, that's been a significant shift where we're working together on a, on a huge array of initiatives that don't actually, you wouldn't badge up necessarily as, 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 as procurement. But, but, and that's a, that's a, you know, so we have a responsible business development initiative where we're looking at um, the creation of um, community investment funds and how we can actually drive um, greater impact within the communities within which we serve. Um, and, and we've invested also on bringing a senior leader um, from a completely different sector to drive our um, equality um, uh, and diversity and inclusion agenda. We, uh, so fantastic individual. And we're doing things in the space of the last three months which never existed within our industry before. So we've got a, a number of um, networks and listening circles that we've set up. And that's everything from um, a, a working parents um, network through to looking at, at race, um, um, gender and, and, and various other issues and they're all sponsored at a very very senior level so our, our CEO in the UK um, is the sponsor of our um, working parents initiative, she's a, she's a single mother in her own right, very inspirational character um, and I think it's a huge challenge to us as well particularly with what's happened in the last 12 months with Covid of people have been, we've been working remotely for 16 months and people have had a far more flexible approach to working life. And I think now that we're, we're sort of marching into the opening up of restrictions in the UK, keeping, um, letting our workforce know that we're supportive of remote working and, and, and greater flexibility it is a big shift within our sector. It was a very much, if I go back only two and a half years, very much a a culture of presenteeism I would spend you know four days a week uh, in the London office um, so it, we're, we're changing in, in, in lots of ways and I think the ESG is absolutely core to, to, to the streams of, of, of a different way of governing our organization through independent scrutiny far more um, daily awareness of, of what we need to do with our people not only to retain but to attract new, new talent and I think this this um, Again, this huge responsibility of we need to, you know, be supportive of, uh, uh, of the communities we work in. We need to be working far more sustainable ways and, and really doing something deep and meaningful with carbon. So, so on this level, so I want to go a bit uh, continuing on this area. So from the, the, your area of expertise, and we touched a bit that, but I would like to go a bit more deeper. So when it comes to supply chain and procurement, um, you have a lot of experience both on the strategical level but on the practical level and like you mentioned there's a lot of challenges 
that it comes to very practical things on the day to day, like certifications, like uh, um, dealing even about knowing what this means, because a lot of these topics for us are kind of very trendy and we are completely deep on this, but most of people don't even have a clue. And, and for instance, one of the, the things I always remind to people is that from the 430 million SMEs, okay, the number can go in one direction or the other, depends on how do you see the source. For instance, the UK alone, I think official numbers around 6 million SMEs and um, startups. Most of them don't even have a website. Most of them, like you said, is a person in a van or a family, um, stuff like that. But this is the biggest shank of the world economy. So from your experience in, in supply chain and procurement, and that's, of course, dealing with close to 200,000 companies and as well with a company with close to 200,000 people, what would be like the, the practical things that you can really do to change the business ecosystem and really create value for them, but at the same time change some of these big broader topics that we have like carbon neutral, ESG and so forth. Because a lot of these things is about education, but as well making things simple. Because what I've been finding is of course, you and me have a strong academic background and uh, a lot of research and, and masters or, or in the UK is a lot of, a lot of digital, a lot of academic uh, uh, background, but uh, the reality is probably 99% percent of people in the industry have no degree and they are coping with all of this but i think in the next couple of years and actually with the present with the, everything that comes with the fourth industrial revolution with artificial intelligence with all this kind of acceleration of digital transformation a lot of this business will be kind of uh, automated or will be changed but at the same time, we still have to cope with the same problems that is ESG and a lot of different things. So I'd like to hear a bit of a kind of a top down understanding from both your at as an academic, your at as an industry leader, but as well, probably the experience of dealing with so much different companies and having to find solutions and manage all the complexity um, and as well make the complexity simple. Okay, again, a broad, a broad question, but if I, if I, if I frame that as, as a particular example of, um, ha, an example of driving, I think, forward a far more better and simplified way of working and what we could do to make a difference is probably if I look at my experience with, with NG Bailey. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work with a, a senior academic with, within Durham um, Business School, and there was actually a paper that was produced on the back of this piece of work that we did, uh, which was which was a client of choice initiative, and that was effect. And I, and I still stand by the principles that that is a, a far uh, better way of working with suppliers. So the context in that business, smaller supply chain, three and a half thousand um, vendors, but very very low levels of relevance in terms of uh, and awareness of capability capacity. Um, and that 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 still exists uh, today in day to day challenges I have with NG. You know, when you have a when you have more than a hundred thousand spenders, having that deep level of awareness of a, of an organisation's capability, capacity, even even down to the number of people that it employs, where it, where their where their sweet spot is from a value perspective, from a sector perspective, from a geographical perspective, um, and during that piece of work at uh, NG Bailey, we profiled. Um, 900 organisations with with a really deep dive, which was a, you know, a huge amount of uh, of effort, and it's probably the closest I've come to, to having a, a a digital view, even though it was quite manual in the way that we put it together, of 900 organisations that was all of those factors that we've talked about on a very kind of red amber green dashboard, that was able to be presented to all of the divisional businesses, and it was hugely eye opening in terms of as a client the amount of waste uh, and duplicate effort that you can drive into a supply chain when you don't have awareness of, of all of those factors. Um, for example, you know, people that never wanted to work in London from a region that we would invite to tender every single London-based education project, even though they wanted to be in the north of England and perhaps work in leisure or nuclear or, 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 or different sectors. So the ability to um, obtain really meaningful information at the point where you onboard a vendor onto your supply chain and how you manage and validate that on a on an ongoing process i think is is something that as an industry we aren't great at and i think there's a there's a huge amount of opportunity um, and i think again understanding the maturity of, of smes you talked about smes we are a tier one 
um, supplier to the cabinet office to government they're a major client of ours and we sit on a on a on a, a, a forum with the cabinet office with a number of, uh, of other uh, leading organizations and we have significant um, pressures and targets to bring more and more SMEs into our supply chain and get them active on our projects which we're which we're, which we're very good at and, and, and uh, they are a, a huge part of our supply chain but it's that's such a broad range of organizations from micro organizations that could be a, your owner operator man in a van through to an organization with let's say 50 staff and slightly less than 10 million pounds worth of turnover it's a huge difference in maturity there and we sometimes treat all of those suppliers in the same way we will request information in the same way and their ability to deal with us as a client is sometimes quite mixed and we get low level of uh, of engagement and responses to those types of initiatives which can frustrate both parties so um, again i think it's the the ability to quickly unlock the true capability and maturity of an organization validate the responses keep that information relevant is going to be where the big shift comes from in, in, in our sector. I think these are for me the most important things and that's part of the work that, I, that I've been putting together both on this podcast series but as well with the platform Cities ABC and Open Business Council. And the challenge is like you said is how to really find solutions that, that can actually be customized because like you said one thing is a company a multinational that has different needs from a company that is with 10 million and ironically if you look at uh, from the 400 million plus SMEs in the world, all of them are less than 1 million. So we have 99% of the world economy and jobs on that spectrum. And although, of course, the, the numbers are on the multinationals, but it's the challenge we have. So, so uh, NG is a French company and uh, Europe has a very strong um, understanding of um, ESG, of sustainability, and of course, a lot of these topics we're talking. So as a global player, uh, I know that you are more focused on the UK as a business, but as well, you're global on the procurement. How do you see this from a geolocation perspective? Because of course, each country has different needs and different velocities, um, but you can only solve this problem if you think globally, because if you have a country thinking about solving this on a national level and the rest of the providers of uh, both services and energy, or whatever the stuff, not not aligning it's a worth sometimes it's a worth it's worthless but as well in a COVID-19 world is even more complex so I would like to hear your notes on this yeah and and, and you're you're absolutely right we you know we do need a consistent um, approach to these challenges and I think within NG our uh, uh, the, the, the majority of these um, big um, global um, challenges are managed centrally we say so we have a, a number of teams sat in Paris that strive to drive consistent solutions across all of our territories and all of our supply chain. So we have um, a, a, a relationship to, to, with, with an organization that looks specifically at the sustainability performance of our major contractors, around 50 or so organizations. And that is a consistent approach that we use to mapping their to mapping our relationship and their performance with us. And that's whether it's in North America, Australia, whether it's in Latin America or in the UK, there's, there's, there's challenges associated with that. And there's, there's, there's been a, uh, you know, it's been a huge investment to, to, to drive that. Um, training, um, we've deployed a, um, a competency assessment for procurement staff, um, which, was, which my, my team designed in the UK. And it's actually something we've been building upon for the last several years. Um, but wherever you are in the world, we map the capability and capacity uh, capability um, of a procurement individual, whether they're at apprentice level or, or, or a head of procurement, in a very consistent way against a very consistent set of requirements and target common training, which helps to kind of really bring the level uh, of procurement uh, up. So that's being deployed not only in the UK, but in Latin America and over in our MESCAP business are the two kind of early adopters of that assessment. So it's having a consistent view of, of people, consistent training of people, um, finding those um, organizations or like particularly some of the consultant organizations that have a, a, a scale to support us on a global basis is really important. Um, lots of opportunity for us to run off and partner with a, a local organization that hasn't got the capability to even translate solutions into the multiple languages we've got across our business. Um, 
and I think we've been very good uh, as an organisation centrally at reaching out to other businesses to bring in um, expertise, uh, and, and you know, from from cross cross sector. But a, a number of workshops, for example, with L'Oreal, uh, again, a, a, an obvious French link, but looking at what they're doing globally with supply chains in terms of not only inclusion um, but, 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 and, and diversity, but looking at carbon has been quite insightful. Yeah, and this, this is kind of uh, one of the biggest things uh, that, that are really important, this kind of education, coaching, and continuously pushing things forward. So from your areas of expertise is a couple of areas. So we talk about procurement, net zero carbon, um, but you have as well enterprise value, corporate strategy, <clears throat> culture and change management, cultural transformation. So can you tell us about these areas? Because these areas are more important than anything because you cannot really move organizations without looking at this. And this is not about technology trends. It's not about uh, big uh, things. It's about really practicality, about dealing with people, organizations, like you mentioned before. Yeah, I mean, uh, so if I go on to the culture, the culture change, um, I mean, probably that was one of the biggest um, attractions and challenges for me of joining NG. So um, Nicola Lovett, who's our CEO, brought me into the NG business and we had a very, you know, open and honest conversation about where procurement was within NG in the UK at that period of time. Um, the turnover of staff was very high within the procurement space. Uh, we, we got, in some instances, three heads of procurement in a division within an 18-month period, so very high level of churn. What's really important within the NG business is, again, driving that consistency. Group deploy an engagement questionnaire to every business unit on an annual basis across all areas and all teams. And the procurement team were sort of 60% engaged. So they were in excess of 20% below the, the engagement score of, a, of, a, of another central services team, such as HR or finance. So. This was a, a team that were also from a financial performance uh, perspective, wasn't delivering to plan and had, and had disappointed the business probably for a number of years and had become very, very fragmented and, and isolated from the, um, the key stakeholders within the business. So that was a big challenge, but, but, a, but, but a great opportunity for, for, for me, to, me to join and make a difference. And I think in terms of, Three years on, you know, we've driven um, huge amounts of change within the procurement team. We actually won team of the year this year, which again is in an annual event for, for procurement and responsible business. So I think that shows the journey we've been on over the last three years. Our engagement score is, is 83%. So we've made a, more than a 20% improvement in three years. And some of the, 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 the methods, the real practical steps, as you say, of delivering that is... Um, a no ego approach for procurement. Um, this is about understanding where we're a service delivery team. We're, we're here to support the business. We're not here to dictate. It's about delivering procurement with the business, not to the business. Um, some of the steps that we've done is, um, again, get that competency assessment in place for every single individual, um, whether they're at an apprentice level, and we've invested heavily in apprentices, through to our procurement managers, our, our, our senior procurement managers, our category leaders. Three years ago, it was about mapping. This is, the, this is the minimum standard we want for that role, and this is where you're performing, but this is how we're going to get you where you want to be. Professionalizing the, 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 the function, um, pretty much every, every new member of the team is on a, is on a pathway to become SIPs accredited, so uh, become a, a professional in their field. Um, we've got a number of heavy investment in training. My, most of my senior team are on MBAs or, 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 or senior, senior leadership development pathways. Uh, and we've co-created the strategy with this, the, 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 the teams. So working hand in glove with finance to make sure we're targeting the right initiatives. We're getting procurement activity validated and we aren't focusing on, on peripheral um, activities that aren't fundamental to the delivery of COI. So return on investment for the function, um, is, it was, was circa 300% when I joined, we're now up at 800% return on investment. So that's an 800% return on the cost of the function in, in overhead terms, which, which ironically we've also been able to reduce by 30% in that period. So the, 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 the team has 
reshaped quite significantly over that period. So we've brought subject matter expertise in who are capable of doing more with less um, and elevated that structure. And it was equally about building um, very, very clear succession within the team. Um, when my predecessor left the business uh, and I joined, the only option for the business was to go outside of the organisation for talent at the CPO level. Now I feel I've got a number of individuals that sit beneath me that are you know, very, very capable of, of stepping forward and taking on a, a, a bigger leadership role. So a myriad of activities, but something I'm, I'm really passionate about and has been a, you know, a huge focus for the last three years. So I would like to, if you wouldn't mind to tell to our audience, and I would like as well to understand. So any kind of case study of like, uh, of course, not mentioning names or anything, but I think when, like you mentioned, well, these numbers are really impressive, both in terms of return on investment, but as well, this, the zero ego and things like that. I think it's a very good one. So can you tell us a bit like from like a practical case study, how you deal with, let's say, a very big complex subject uh, or some kind of very political because, of course, big organizations like NG and any other big organization have a lot of challenge with managing egos of big personalities. And as well, because there's so much people involved, a lot of a small, a small subject might become really a very nightmare. So how do you deal with this? And, of course, with your different hats? Because I think this is really one of the biggest challenges that people always forget. We, when we have these kind of discussions, we always go, okay, theory and a lot of different things, but okay, how we really go on the details. And you mentioned as well the importance of mentors to you, which is very dear for me as well. Um, yeah, a bit of your experience on that, if you want to share some experience or some kind of uh, anecdote of things that are relevant. I mean, I, can, I, I, will, I will anonymize uh, the organization, but um, I, I, in a previous role, I joined um, at a very, very interesting time within the organization's um, history. Um, we were um, just coming out of the recession, sort of the, the, the 2012 market turndown, um, that, that organization's um, supply chain and work winning capabilities have been heavily compromised by that. They were, uh, you know, very, they have been uh, very, very uh, sort of consolidated as an organization. And then on the kind of the, 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 the upside of coming out of that market, they'd secured a significant amount of work, but had very, very poor relationships within the supply chain. So number one on the exec risk register was surety of supply. How are we going to get the organizations around us to deliver? You've then got a very, very fragmented model, almost like a franchise model, where you've got different divisions and different regions that did their own thing and were effectively, uh, uh, as long as they delivered a level of P&L, the how they went about it, who they worked with, how they worked was pretty much left to their own devices. And to... Uh, to kind of bring a, a perfect storm into that, there had been a number of efforts historically to do big bang procurement changes. And we brought people in at very, very senior levels who'd really try to, and I, I'm gonna use that example, do procurement to the business and, and damage the brand of procurement quite significantly. So coming into that environment was, was very, very challenging. And again, in terms of that um, no ego approach, the practical steps of driving, uh, so what was the business ask? We needed to build a supply chain. We need to rebuild our relationships with the supply chain. We needed to get surety of, deliver, uh, surety of supply, and we needed to educate the stakeholders within the business of a better way of, of doing and, uh, and being with, with procurement. So some of the practical steps were finding the individuals within the operational teams that were the biggest protagonists and, 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 and critics of procurement and bringing them into the heart of the solution so sitting down in a room with them and I think taking it on the chin in terms of the good the bad and the ugly of all of their experiences and crafting that solution even though it was quite challenging and complicated with them so getting their buy into the fact that it's going to be a data driven fact-based um, journey that we're going to go on together so it's not going to be i think you think we're going to go out we're going to analyze, analyze your market we're going to look at the types of clients you've been working for which suppliers you've been working with what procurement routes where you've been making money where you've been losing money and we're going to shape a better way of being together and again it's going to be data driven because we're going to understand your supply chain and i think this was the example i'm giving you about profiling those 900 organizations in depth 
Equally, it was about, again, not eating the elephant, but breaking the organization down and, and, and building those cross-functional working groups in a, on a region by region basis and working through a very structured workshop basis. So these cross-functional teams were commercial, they were work winning, they were estimating, procurement, design, technical. So getting the individuals around the table to all contribute their, their thoughts and feelings. Um, and having no predetermined solutions. So the suppliers we profiled, it didn't matter whether we'd worked with them historically or never before. If there was a desire to use them within the business, we profiled them. And then we presented that rich data back to the regions to build a region by region supply chain and then to aggregate those suppliers that sat in multiple regions and then it was about um, demonstrating that the, 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 the um, financial impact to the business of, 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 of doing that so better return through commercial reward rebates um, aggregating spend uh, and driving volumetric rebate up with certain agreements um, building communities of innovation in key categories so we start to get um, more intelligent in our solutions, uh, more innovation, um, capturing um, below the line opportunity where suppliers were given as different alternatives. So that probably is a, a hopefully answers your question, but, a, but a, 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 a real life example of what that looks like. It's a huge investment of time and energy. You've got to be fairly relentless in terms of how you deploy it um, and having the right people around you as well, because that, that went hand in hand with a you know, a, a significant change in the, in, in the quality and types of individuals we brought into the function. Yeah, I think this is great for everyone listening to us, for me as well, because these details are really key for successful companies. And I think uh, a successful company is a company that creates process and as well the communication pro that you mentioned, but as well the flows, because that makes a big difference and the successful, because in the end of the day, that's what you have. I know that we passed one hour. If you have still a bit more of time, I, I, I still have two or three questions. So I just want to go. So the next question is, is more broader and it touched some of the areas you mentioned. So especially when it comes to the energy sector and for us, your former CEO became a carbon neutral ambassador, Isabel Corpé, your previous your present one. It's interesting that this multi-billion dollar company led uh, by a woman, which is quite important as well. But uh, one of the things that she mentioned, I was reading a speech of hers, were about the importance of digital transformation for your, in, for your, your industries. And as well, how to take this from within to outside. So, um, especially when it comes to the energy. Of course, right now we have the, the green revolution going on. There's a lot of discussions about electric vehicles that are right now, especially after Tesla made the mainstream becoming right now the status quo. There's, of course, the constru construction industry that is becoming right now very transformed by both digital twins, uh, all the IoT systems, and a lot of forfeit this revolution kind of alignment. And of course, especially in the energy, there's all the kind of green energy, but as well, how to take forward, because there's a pressure not only for companies like yours, but as well for the investors. For instance, there was a huge political uh, and as well PR crisis, for instance, for the Gates Foundation, because they had too much companies. They were not carbon neutral solution driven. Um, and that backfires as well for the portfolio. So I, I, your companies are going through a lot, lot of challenges, uh, bearing in mind all these different things. So how do you see the uh, we touched most of these things, but I would like to touch from the digital angle, so digital transformation and the innovation angle, because of course, uh, the next couple of decades are going to be even more disruptive, more challenging. And uh, of course, we're talking about data, but we're talking about uh, as well sensors. We're talking about how we shift all this massive economy, economical weight, because of course, you cannot just look at economies that are dependent of oil and gas suddenly you cannot just change it and like this make everything there's all the legacy systems that's thousands of companies millions of people involved with this so how do you see the big picture especially as a researcher but as well with someone very deeply in, within the industry uh, and, and again so so many opportunities um for digital within our within our sector and and, and let's not equally ignore the, the the huge services business that we have and i think the if you look at the you know traditional kind of maintenance regimes that have existed in a non-digital world um, huge amounts of kind of waste and uh, wasted activity and abortive costs in that space and as you say uh, sensors um, on, on key equipment dictating 
maintenance regimes rather than uh, arbitrary arbitrary call out schedules has an opportunity to, to really kind of transform that space. Um, from a supply chain perspective, we've touched on this. So you know, every organization within our sector all doing exactly the same largely manual checks and balances on vendor onboarding. There's so much opportunity for us to digitize that um, and, 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 and equally to to validate uh, 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 and have uh, assurance around that using AI and, 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 and machine learning and, and, and continually development that understanding, as I said, capabilities, capacities, not doing a, a, a vendor onboarding and then um, only reviewing that in a year's time when the, the whole landscape of that organization is likely to have changed. Um, I think it's how we build um, uh, ecosystems within our supply chain, how we bring, how we connect suppliers together and enable them to deliver a better solution for us um, is something that I think is going to be unlocked by this, this greater move into, in, in, into digital. Um, but I think from a cost perspective, there's going to be so much, so many uh, opportunities for us to be uh, far more aware of outturn costs on, on historical projects using digital. Um, so, you know, decisions we make at tender stage versus what actually gets borne out in the, in the, in the, the finished product and the, uh, for, for the client. Supplier performance, the ability to, uh, uh, at, you know, at a touch assess the performance of a particular subcontractor on, on a project in real time and is to gather that rich data, start to look at variations, start to look at um, snagging defects in, in a digital world. Um, huge amounts of opportunity and, uh, uh, and, 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 and capability for us, it's definitely to be unlocked. That is, I think, great opportunities and great challenge as well. But I think with, like you mentioned, with a great challenge comes great opportunities. So last, uh, probably last uh, one, one or two notes. So um, all of these things we've been talking are within the context of the fourth industrial revolution. And um, as, an, as an, a researcher and an academic, I would like to hear your thoughts um, because you have very quite unique um, helicopter view on how society can progress and you touch a lot of different areas how we can do this but I would like to see how you see especially the concepts of the fourth industrial revolution and as well the concept of society 5.0 that was created by the the researchers in the University of Tokyo and then taken by the Prime Minister of Japan um, as a concept that makes a, a more balanced society between technology and humans and as well the ecosystem and environment and business so I would like to see how do you see this kind of two main subjects that are over all of us, and as well as uh, both a researcher and both um, a business leader, and um, as well uh, behind a big corporation that can actually make a big difference on this. I mean, it's a, 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 huge, a huge question. I think, again, we're at such a, um, the last 16 months for me have really um, accelerated that conversation because we've seen uh, how significantly society shifted just in the last 16 months. And, and I think traditional patterns of work and poor engagement with technology becoming uh, the new normal, really, in, 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 every, in every day. And the changes we've made as a business, I mean, we have um, divested significant amounts of our physical building stock, our offices, over the course of the last 16 months with a view that we're going to completely change the, the, the way in which people work. Um, that's going to have a, a number of, it's going to significantly change the shape of our workforce. I think it's made us challenge, um, I don't want to say how, how luxurious previous organisational structures have been, but we've, we've, we, 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 organisations have grown around those, those older ways of working and, we, and they, were, they were very much accepted. And I think in this new space, we're, we're challenging that and we're looking at working smarter, working leaner, um, driving investment into technology. Uh, we, we've looked very, very deeply at our systems and processes and we're making a, a, a significant investment in that space. Um, and I think I can see how um, embracing um, digital, in, in, a, in, in particularly within procurement, is going to really change the way that we that, that we operate, and is already starting to. And uh, and I also think that again, using using digital platforms, the opportunity for us to collaborate with other major tier one providers to aggregate spend and to drive 
you know, greater value and greater benefit for clients is something that has happened, you know, in a really accelerated and compressed time frame within the just, you know, probably just the last six or so months for us. So the speed of the speed of uh, change in the, the the way that we're embracing technology, I think, has been massively amplified by uh, what we've all been through in the last sixteen months, and I see that changing organisations, uh, you know, significantly moving forward. Yeah, there was an interview actually that you mentioned about that. So there was a, about the the massive procurement transformation, especially when it comes to digital. So. We have blockchain technology. Um, we have all the different process of digitization. We have big data. We have the digital twins. So from the procurement side, and I think this more from a technology side, how do you see this? And of course, this is a podcast as well, a lot about technology. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Um, sorry, specifically in terms of ju just the- just Procurement, the in specific in terms of procurement supply chain, the digital transformation on these areas, because there was a, an interview we did with the, the um, B2E media where you touched this, and it was very interesting. I would like to have some insights on, on that level. So, I mean, we, we, we had a, um, we've got a project at the minute, a significant transformation project under the, 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 the code name Mercury, um, which is about changing our complete end-to-end -end, um, data management of, of every kind of touch point within our business. So whether this is about HR data, hire to retire, um, procure to pay, all of the systems-based activities within our, within our organization, we're looking to, to, to change and upgrade significantly. But within the procurement space, I think it, it, the, the, the moving into a, a more digitally enabled environment helps us enormously in terms of that continual refresh of, of data and information. So our, our knowledge of suppliers, um, real time knowledge of suppliers, how their business is evolving, whether it's about our payment terms, whether it's about their own financial stability, their performance on site, um, the, the ability to have algorithms that kind of continually inform and enrich our decision making, um, how we can bring, um, we can build bespoke supply chains for particular projects through having that knowledge of capability capacity coupled with performance, um, exposure levels to certain organisations which are sometimes hidden, and setting thresholds up there to make sure we aren't having an overexposure to certain uh, organisations. Uh, the, the ability to look more uh, at multi-BU performance, you know, we have a number of suppliers that, that touch various geographical areas and the ability to pull all of that information together into kind of pick dashboards, um, compliance, again, we, we, we generate a lot of uh, commercial reward through spend and understanding where opportunities are lost. Um, at tender stage through different decisions being made uh, massively important so i see uh, i see us having a um, far more dashboard data driven approach to procurement not only when we're building supply chains but seeing how they how they deliver benefit over the over the, the, the project duration really and lifespan so I think, I think we are passing one, one hour and a half so i think i don't know probably as a, as a wrap up any notes that you want uh, as well? You've been teaching in leading business schools. You are as well, um, uh, you've been in Cambridge and now you're teaching, uh, you study in Cambridge, but now you are in Nottingham and Durham as a guest lecturer. So you have both the academic, but education level as well. And as well, for instance, I see that you, you as well uh, were part of the supply chain sustainability school, which is an interesting concept as well. Anything's on the education side or any final notes that you want to transmit to our audience uh, where they can actually learn and take these um, on a day-to-day -day, like you've been doing it from the theory and the practice? I think, uh, you know, so, something that's interesting, and actually I was, uh, I've, I've had a, a nine-year relationship with Nottingham Business School as a, an external advising practitioner on their predominantly management um, program. And I was sat with a number of their um, academics yesterday, uh, executive dean and, and a number of industry partners that support the business school. And we were looking um, quite closely at the syllabus uh, of, of all the different path pathways in management. And I think one thing that I, I, I saw as a, as a real um, opportunity and, and, and almost a, a gap was about what was digital and blockchain within these um, you know, quite, quite senior 
um, management uh, degree pathways, and I think there's a there's a there's a, a real opportunity now for, for within within um, the university for them to start to embed that skill set into graduates. So they they're, they're coming out of those programs very relevant to the to the current challenges of uh, of industry. So I think that that was a gap I, I noticed, and I think something that is a, is a real opportunity for uh, the universities to be driving. That is a very important thing. So um, I want to thank you for your time, Jonathan. I have a lot of more questions, but this is quite a deep topic. So we're going to put links to some of the interviews, some of the quotes that you've been having. I found a couple of interesting quotes from you and a lot of your research academic that I suggest people to, to search. So one note, of, people can find some of your papers or some of your research in, in online, just for, for people listening to us. Uh, yes, so I, I've, uh, I, I, could, I could send you a link to some of that, but I've, I've, I've co-authored a, a, a paper with uh, Karen, Professor Karen Fernandez from the Durham um, Business School. We, 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 we did a piece of work together, uh, and, and I think my, my, uh, probably one of my theses is out there from the MBA as well, so that will be uh, in the public domain. And I've done some conference papers for, for, for BAM in the UK in, in, in recent years as well. Yeah, we'll put all these links. Uh, actually, there's a, a big source of links and interviews that you did as well about, uh, for instance, there's a couple of things that I suggest for people to looking, special people looking in, in supply chain and procurement because you are one of the global leaders, experts on this area. So, for instance, from um, massive procurement transformation, um, there's as well the first one under the day is tips and advice for new CPOs. There's the supply chain school that I mentioned. There's a lot of interesting research that, that is there. So I suggest everyone to learn, and I'm sure that Jonathan will be as well uh, eager to, to teach and pass this because you have a, a huge knowledge that is amazing. So I want to thank you for your time, Jonathan. Uh, it's been a huge pleasure and, and privilege as well. And I've been learning a lot, especially on these details, how to take this forward. And I'm sure that you're going to have probably, I think this go, gave me an idea of doing pro probably a live in the future about... Uh, digital transformation for procurement energy sector because I have a couple of people asking me about these sectors and uh, it's an area that there's not so much knowledge so thank you so much for your time it's been a real pleasure thank you